Right, I did a full video uh, the other day, wading through the CAA's call for input document. The irony of producing my longest ever video on YouTube complaining about a long and rambling document wasn't lost on me, so today I'm outlining what the main points are that have got so many of us riled up, and crucially, how to respond to the CAA directly without spending truckloads of time trying to understand everything. There are some crazy stuff being proposed, um, lumping small drones with those up to 25 kilograms, trying to remove the freedoms that the little sub 250 gram models enjoy, and the truly terrible, I think, Orwellian vision for a remote ID. And I'm trying to do all of this in under five minutes and help you respond in under five minutes too. So, straight on. First advice, do not bother reading this absolutely insane support document they produced to try and explain the background. It's staggeringly confusing, poorly written in my opinion, so only refer to it if you need to, but I'm going to focus on the questions themselves. You can also now email a free text response if you want directly to the CAA, but my fear with that is that the answers won't be collated properly. Completing the questionnaire online will force the responses to be collated and counted for each question. Anyway, uh, that's what I think. You've got to love my optimism, really, haven't you? Anyway, look, click the link below to get taken straight to the online questionnaire. Complete the personal details and then get straight onto the 19 questions, many of which repeat but are based on slightly different subjects. Now my first key point is don't be lulled into just answering yes to any of the questions that talk about mitigating security and safety threats or just simplifying the rules and regulations. I will list all of my responses in a pinned comment below so you can see my ideas and shape them for your own answers. But this idea of mitigating threats and safety pops up near the beginning, uh, question two, as part of a long multi-part question that includes other pointless rubbish like should new rules be user-centric or easy to understand. The whole thing is worded to lull you into just saying yes because everybody wants to be safe, secure and have things simplified, but they don't actually state what this so-called evolving security threat is, nor do they provide any evidence for safety issues either. And on simplifying the categories and permissions. Again, it sounds good, but actually it isn't. So again, I answered no, because in questions four and five, they talk about combining the types of flight categories, combining uh, A1, which is flights directly overhead people, with A3, which is flights way out, uh, far away from people in open countryside. They don't even mention at all A2 flights, which are flying near people. So again, it's an incomplete set of details that seems to make no sense. So question five is a no, because how can it make sense to combine the rules for flying directly over people with the other rules with very different risks of flying far away from people in open countryside? And third, we have this nasty repeated question on simplifying the exemptions for sub 250 gram drones like the Mini 3 Pro. They talk about the threat that these small models can pose due to confusion over their classification as a toy and their ability to enter controlled airspace or sensitive areas. Now presumably again, this is a direct response to these so-called auditors annoying the police or army or other premises, flying drones right up to the edge of their premises. But this is a problem that could easily be resolved by GPS-based geofencing. Where they say simplifying, I'm sorry, I see removing. So again, each time this was asked, it was a clear no for me, as these small drones really pose practically no safety threat whatsoever. Next section on transition for unclassified drones is very disappointing as this also refers to current models being sold up to 2026, including brand new Air 3, which has got this lovely new C1 uh, label that the CAA are ignoring. Um, the reason why it's gonna be classed as transitional is because despite the EASA rules being in place for five years by then, these won't have any requirements or labels that CAA are still trying to formulate and dream up. So again, my answer here on changing the way these are handled was actually yes, to an extent, but not in the way they're suggesting. And instead they should just allow existing C classified drones the same rights that are enjoyed in Europe. And that would mean C1 drones like the Air 3 or the Mavic 3 being able to be flown in a lot more areas. Question nine is so vague it's pointless, talking about challenges that various stakeholders face without actually mentioning who these stakeholders are or properly specifying the challenges. So again, a clear no from me. There's not enough detail, so how can I answer it? Question 10, uh, same as question two, referring to the drone's technical requirements, but again, they refer to this unspecified and unfounded security and safety threats with no actual evidence. So again, no from me. But 
it is the uh, section for question 11 onwards that really gets interesting implementing manufacturing requirements and simplifying and combining the C classifications themselves. Uh, the reference notes in this document uh, they, for, for question 10, they talk about combining C1 with C2 and C3 classifications which to me seems absolutely bonkers. That's combining sub 900 gram models with the much larger heavier models right up to 25 kilograms. And this is a theme they seem hell bent on for some reason. So it was a flat no to question 10. Stop trying to simplify or combine classifications because it just means they're all gonna be lumped together. Question 12 asks about labels, which to me again, they should resolve just by redeploying, re-employing if you like, uh, the simple EASA C uh, numeric labels that are already in place. Uh, question 13, another nasty one on simplifying or more likely removing, as I said, the exemptions for small sub 250 gram drones, which again, obviously I said no to, but it is question 14 that you really, really, really need to take a look at. And this is a section of this document that I think you really should read. It's sections 3.15 to 3.120. And they talk about their plans for remote ID and how they want to track the serial number, takeoff point, route flown, height flown, and the speed flown, all accessible locally as well as remotely on servers, both in real time and stored for historical flights too, in their own chilling words for re-education, fines or conviction. Now I know some of you are going to argue that if you're flying right and not doing anything wrong, then what have you got to hide? But there are huge data issues here with the real possibility of third parties being employed to trawl through flight logs and penalise for flights that the pilot judged to be safe while somebody somewhere else remote without any knowledge of the actual flight can then turn around and say, well, actually, no, you've misinterpreted the swathes of vague rules like VLOS and they can literally send a fine in the post. Now, would this happen for cars on the road to stop speeding divers? No chance. So why impose it on drones? And really, do they honestly expect criminals to actually register their drones properly and give their full details? Of course not. So this can only be about the persecution of everyday flyers, making innocent or minor mistakes and nothing to do with genuine security because real criminals won't be registered anywhere. And that's why geofencing, I think, is a far better solution here. So, again, still, I still feel quite strongly about this. Question 14, should the CAA implement remote ID was a resounding no, because remote ID has got nothing to do with flight safety and in the CAA's own words, it's just about re-education, fines or convictions. It's serious stuff, it does need fighting. Now, to be honest, the remaining questions are fairly straightforward. The last question, 19, allows you to talk about anything else you would like to see them consider. Um, I mentioned a few rules for, uh, what did I do? Yeah, I mentioned uh, fewer rules for the smaller sub one kilogram drones that most people fly, but clearly present the lowest risk. I also mention about height-based geo restrictions and expanding the rules on VLOS to cover the area that the drone is flying rather than worrying about whether or not you can make out which way the drone, the drone is actually pointing. When rules lose the support of the masses, they get ignored by the masses. And that is what's happening with VLOS today, especially after the recent updated guidance. And above all, I said that the rules and regulations should be based on evidence, not speculation and fear-mongering. There is no evidence of real genuine issues that drones have caused, and yet the regulations around them are already insane and about to get worse. So here's your chance. Put down anything that's annoying you and that you want to see changed in that last question. Um, I'll put a link to my longer video if you want uh, specific details on any part of this or any particular question, or if nothing else, you can have a laugh at seeing me get really riled up on that one. But um, for this response, you do need to get this done in the next week. Uh, 7th of September is when it closes. They've only given us a few weeks and they didn't even bother emailing all of the people on their database that have registered their drone. So it's bad everywhere you look. But um, anyway, look, um, if you do respond, then hopefully they will at least collate and consider the responses and report back to us. Um, I don't know, you've got to admire my optimism, haven't you? Anyway, look, as ever, thoughts below, please. Let me know what you think. And as ever, till next time, have fun, happy flying.